part. So I deal with everything poop, pee, and sex. Okay, so in a nutshell, I try to make it real simple. It'll make more sense once we go through the function of the pelvic floor, what the pelvic floor is, and how that relates to your everyday health. Because all of those three things are physiological and vital functions. So we'll kind of talk more about that. The scoop <coughs> is actually a personal story of mine. I <laughs> definitely had experience with hemorrhoids myself. They are no fun, um, and if any of you have experienced hemorrhoids in the past or are currently suffering with hemorrhoids, um, you know that they're not fun and they're quite painful. So what you're going to learn today is how to kind of minimize the effects of hemorrhoids, how to avoid getting a hemorrhoid um, by doing certain early postures and how to use breathing and relaxing your pelvic floor to help kind of make things really easy and smooth, smoothly down there. So, Constipation is a fairly common um, occurrence that happens to many. So it's about 16% of the population in the U.S. and that kind of equates to 52 million people have su are suffering from constipation. But we're just not talking about it. And so one of my missions in this world is to bring um, some lightheartedness, some humor, and um, kind of break down the barriers of social stigma to kind of talk about me and that there's someone like me that can help with those types of issues. So. We're going to have fun and it's going to be very interactive. We're going to try not to be talking about a lot of So I have props, as you can see. <laughs> OK, so first thing we'll talk about is what is, what is the pelvic floor and what, what are the muscles? So here, this is a side view of a male. You have the spine in the back with the tailbone, the bowel that kind of lays right along the spine, bladder, prostate, and the pubic bone in the front. And if for, for female's sake, you have the uterus in the middle. But what's really important are these these muscles right underneath here that act like a habit or a sling. These are your pelvic floor muscles right through here. So they have a very important function. The first function is actually supporting all the pelvic organs up top that you see. They also help support the abdominal contents. So whenever you cough or sneeze or laugh or jump, these muscles reflexively tighten to help clamp down on the tubes that empty your bowel and bladder so that you, you remain continent throughout the day. Um, they also help uh, reflexively, like when you're coughing, again, clamping down so that the pressure that's coming down through the pelvis is supported and stabilized. So they're huge stabilizers of not only your pelvis because they attach to, this is a pelvic floor model, this is your hip. You kind of put your hand on your hip, that's the top bone that you're going to feel. The pubic bone is in the front, right up here, so your bladder is sitting right behind there. And in the back, you have your sacrum and the tailbone. And all of these muscles that you see here are pelvic floor muscles. They have attachments to your sit bones. So what you're sitting now, everything in between the sit bones are your pelvic floor muscles. You also have attachments from your hip, because your hip bone is coming in through here. And the muscles of the head and the thigh also come in through this cavity, this pelvic bone, to help support and stabilize your your pelvis, your back, your legs. Where's your piriformis? So the piriformis is running through here. Yep. And then it's coming to attach to the femur right over here. So the piriformis works in conjunction with your pelvic floor muscles. And oftentimes hip dysfunctions and hip pain can actually be an indicator that it's the pelvic floor that actually is in need of help and not the hip itself. So a lot of these, these can be referred from the pelvic floor. So we talked about sphincteric control and how they kind of clamp down on the rectum and the urethra to help make you stay continent throughout the day so you're not cooking your pee while you're doing your activities. They also aid in sexual appreciation. They aid in orgasm and ejaculation. So whenever we orgasm or ejaculate, those muscles that attach to the genitals, so whether it's the base of the penis or the clitoris, they spasmatically contract to help aid with erection. They also help aid elimination of fluids during ejaculation. So they're very important when it comes to um, libido and the function of, of sexual activity. So how do these muscles work? What makes them so unique? Well, they work just like any other muscle in your body. So if we take the bicep analogy, right? If I want to use my bicep or do a curl, I can tighten my bicep and it gets Popeye-like, right? If I want to relax the muscle, I just kind of bring it to my side. So I'm not really contracting it or using it, but there's always this like baseline tone. You're not rocking around on the floppy. There's always this baseline tone. And then if you want to relax or stretch the muscle even further, you can extend your arm or stretch. So the muscles work in the same function. They tighten, like as if you're going to cough, sneeze, um, or jump, 
these muscles reflexively tighten to help oppose the pressure. When you sit on the toilet, they relax and open so that you can eliminate waste. So they work in the very in the same function as any other muscle in your body because this is a, these are muscles, just like skeletal muscle. And I forgot to mention, but if you guys have any questions during, just raise your hand and ask. It's totally interactive. Um, so I want to talk about one muscle in particular where we're going to talk about bowel health. It's called the pubo-rectalis muscle, and it's part of the pelvic floor muscle bowl here. So if we Essentially, that pic this picture that you're seeing on the screen is a picture looking from inside the pelvis. So if we kind of took that top half off of you like a hat, we're looking into the deep part of the bowl. All the organs are removed, but you have uh, you have the, the hiatus for the urethra, you have the rectum, and then it, for a female, you would have the vaginal opening here as well. So the pubic rectalis muscle, which is part of the pelvic floor, that sling, you can see it, it attaches to the pubic bone in the front wrapping around the rectum and then attaching to your, your sacrum, your spine, that lower end of your spine. This muscle is super important when it comes to functioning of elimination, I should say, like how to defecate, how, why is this guy important? Well, when you're walking around, oops, sorry. When you're walking around and when you're sitting upright, this muscle is pretty taut. So it wraps around like a sling. Okay, we're kind of like poking around the rectum and creating a kink like in a hose. So the, your, the tube that empties the, the colon is not straight naturally. It actually has an 80 to 100 degree bend so that you can remain continent throughout the day. Now, when we squat or when well, how we're supposed to actually eliminate our bowels, so like in third world countries when they squat down and get down on the floor like this, they're actually doing this, which puts this entire set of muscles on slack straightening the tube of the rectum, making elimination completely flawless. So you're not straining, you're not pushing, you're completely relaxing. And we'll demonstrate that with some of the models I have here. Okay. We'll talk about that in a second. So what happens when issues start going south, literally, down there? So for one thing, constipation makes things very difficult, right? It could be a slew of things. It could be diet, medications that you're on. Stress is a huge contributing factor to a lot of my patients that I see because stress is, affects your nervous system. And when we talk about the nervous system, you have two types that interact with your body. You have the rest and digest, the one that calms you, you feel really relaxed, and then you have the fight or flight or the sympathetic, right? It's two switches. In order to digest and have peristalsis and to eliminate the bowel, we have to be in that parasympathetic or rest and digest state. If you're under lots of stress, it kind of slows down everything in the gut because if you're running away from a, a danger or a bear, there's a lot of those in Asheville. I just had my first encounter like two days ago, so I was super excited. But yes, yeah, so if you see a bear coming at you, the last thing you're going to want to think about is pooping, peeing, and having sex, right? <laughs> You're just like, you're not, uh, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not hungry, this is not happening. So your body, all the blood from the gut is diverted and sent to your muscles, to the bigger muscles, to your heart and to your lungs because you're running away and you're under this fight or flight kind of response, which is great in an acute situation, but unfortunately in our day and age, everything is fast paced, we're under more stress, technology is taking over, and so we are under almost, I would like to say, almost a little bit of that that heightened state of activity, which makes it difficult to kind of just have the digestive system working properly. So stress is a huge contributing factor, I think, to um, constipation and actually um, uh, digestive health. Um, other things that affect constipation are scar tissues from previous surgeries, um, adhesions. You know, scars are kind of like icebergs where you only see the tip and it looks so small, but deep down it goes really deep. And scar tissue likes to spread to accompanying or a surrounding organs. And that can limit the way these organs kind of function because all of these organs, my colon, all of these, your colon has muscle around it that pumps and pushes the fluid or the, the stool and the, the waist down through the pelvic floor. So they're working, they're always metabolizing, they're moving, and so the motility of these organs are compromised when you have scars or any type of restriction in the abdomen from previous surgeries or even infections. Like if you've gotten sick or had some sort of itis, that also diminishes the um, organ motility and overall health. 
And then we know we have conditions like IBS and Crohn's disease, which can significantly impair digestive health and, um, and function. History of constipation can also stem, stem from when you're a kid. So you might have been constipated when you're a child and then developed uh, improper toileting habits or techniques that later on in life as an adult can cause you to suffer from constipation as well. We also have something that is called a functional constipation, and this is mostly because the nervous system has been impaired, so spinal cord injury or a stroke. That, that is the connection from the brain to the, the rectum itself and to these muscles that is impaired, so, and, and that's more of a functional constipation. I predominantly work with people that have dyssynergic defecation, and dyssynergic defecation is doing the opposite of what you're supposed to do. When you're sitting on the toilet, the muscle should relax. And when you're pushing, the muscle should stay relaxed. But for most people that I see, they re reflexively tighten. So they're tightening, closing off the anus, stopping the flow, and then that stops the urge of peristalsis. So then you not only get poop that's not coming out, or you feel like you're incomplete, or you have to go to the bathroom several times a day because you're not completely emptying, um, it can also create that that sensation where you're always having to strain and push to have a bowel movement. So, so it's very important where these, when we talk about these muscles, how to relax them and how to get in the proper posture so that you don't have to strain or at least eliminate some of the straining that goes on when you're having a bowel movement. But this is a learned behavior and this can even be learned from when you were a child going back to the childhood constipation where you're nervous, your legs can't touch the ground, they're kind of dangling up in the air, you have no support. And we'll talk about how that kind of makes a difference in terms of how these muscles relax. Anal fissures is also an issue that can happen in bowel health, and anal fissures are like paper cuts. If you ever had a paper cut on your knuckle, that's kind of like what an anal fissure is like. And typically it's a result of constipation, straining, and pushing really hard, which makes bowel movements extremely painful because this area is meant to stretch. And if, if you know a paper cut, when you bend your finger, it opens up the wound and it, it poses for a very difficult healing process. And the area around the anus is meant to be moist, it's meant to be wet and warm, which makes it also a difficult area to kind of heal. But with the help of diet, making stools super soft, very, very, very soft, toileting posture techniques, um, certain hands-on therapy techniques that I would implement that relaxes the area and then having a doctor kind of prescribe a cream that will accelerate um, healing even faster. So we kind of deal with anal fissures. But the most important thing is from this is that we can really avoid having anal fissures by just diet, water, exercise, and proper toileting postures and breathing. Other issues that might kind of correlate to issues with constipation um, are, include prolapse. And prolapse is a condition where your pelvic organs um, start to kind of, the ligaments around the pelvic organs, they start to weaken or the muscles become weak and the organs start to kind of come down through the openings of the pelvis. So it, for women it's most common um, because of multiple childbirths. Um, it could even be a high um, impact activity like athletes or high a job that requires heavy lifting repetitively. Prolapse can also happen if you're straining or pushing to have a bowel movement over a chronic period of time because you're in this position where you're constantly pushing and it's adding to the pressure in that pelvis and it's like pushing things down. So all of those factors can contribute to having a prolapse. You also have genetic factors, so if you have a collagen disorder or um, uh, ligaments that are lax, um, that can also contribute to why one uh, person might have a, a, a prolapse versus another. In previous surgeries, I kind of talked about that, but <coughs> scar tissue is not the same as what the tissue was when it was, when it was normal and completely viable. Scar tissue is about 80% of, of its original strength, so, um, and it doesn't really function in the way that uh, connective tissue after it's laid down um, in the way prior, prior to having the scar tissue laid down. So um, that creates more of a, a weakness in terms of the integrity of the pelvic floor soft tissue and musculature. 
In particular to bowel health, because we're talking about poop, um, there's something called a rectocele, which is the name of a specific condition under a prolapse. And that's just when the bowel starts to come down or protrude through the posterior or the back of the vaginal wall. And then it can create more of like an outpouching, which, uh, you know, stool ends up getting stuck in there. And then the only thing that kind of comes out is like a diarrhea type of um, a stool or a really soft stool, because the only thing that can come out is you know, something that's more loose and watery because you have an impaction uh, almost. Um, and <laughs> pelvic floor therapy can certainly help with that because you're gonna strengthen, release any tension patterns that are in there, help with visceral mobilization, which is another technique used by physical therapists that are trained. They help kind of release any tension around the uterus is most likely the bladder and then the rectum to help kind of put things in place. And then if there's scars, most likely that needs to be addressed as well. So um, that's rectocele. So I talked a lot about poor toileting habits, posture, why posture is super important when you're talking, uh, sitting on the toilet. Like when we saw this picture with the, with the pubo rectalis here, you know, if you're sitting upright or if you're sitting on a comfort seat toilet, toilet height, which are super tall, I mean, for most of those, I can't even touch the ground. <laughs> so that would be very inefficient for me and I wouldn't be relaxed. Um, it's important that um, we kind of relax these muscles in an appropriate way when sitting on the toilet, not just sitting upright. Or another thing that I see mostly women do is they hover over a toilet seat because in public. Let's say they have to go and they'll just hover over a toilet seat. And those muscles just will not relax because hip muscles, piriformis muscle, they're all being recruited, your abdominals are holding you up. How are those muscles supposed to relax? They're working in tandem with the rest of your core to help stabilize you in that position. So it's very difficult um, to help them relax in that area. This is a topic I like to bring out a lot because I know I'm guilty of it, but mindful pooping. So how many of us ever take our like iPads or tablets or you know iPhones into the bathroom to kind of browse? I know I'm guilty of it too. I, I am, I know, I know, I'm guilty of it too. And it's great if it's really relaxing you, but let's say you get like a nasty email from your boss or you're reading something on Facebook that's like, oh hell no, what, this, what happened, politics this or that, you know, it kind of gets you into that like, I'm really mad. And what happens to peristalsis, what happens to digestion? It's kind of like that fight or flight. You're upset, you're not relaxed, muscles get tense in your body, stops the urge, and that's it. So uh, this is something that most people don't talk about, but I really feel it's really important when it comes to the nervous system and just like, you know, allowing yourself to have a really good poop without adding the stress to it because you can deal with that later. But, you know, it's not going to happen one or two times. It's over a period of time that you start be, um, creating these patterns or these behavioral kind of um, habits that um, is unknown to you mostly because, you know, we go about our business and we're not really thinking about our pelvic floor or our poop, right? So, um, but it can happen. And so I always encourage, if you're going to do read something or peruse on Facebook, make sure it's something nice and playful so that you feel relaxed and it doesn't interrupt your flow. Rushing is an issue I get with moms and dads. You know, they have kids, they're crying, oh my gosh, the phone is ringing. I, I don't have time to sit on the toilet. And so I tell them, you know, it's really healthy to sit and have a bowel movement for 10, 15, 20 minutes. It's completely okay. And they're looking at me like I'm crazy. Like, where do you want me to find 10, 15 minutes to like have a nice poop, right? So rushing again, it's, you're either really forced, you're like pushing really hard to like get it over with and get it done with, which if you're pushing really hard, these muscles, the pelvic floor that's their job to oppose pressure right when you cough or sneeze they're going to contract when you're pushing really hard and it's really not time to go those muscles are going to reflexively tighten creating again an abnormal or a paradoxical contraction so you're learning to not relax instead you're contracting when you have to go so that that can be a problem um, we talked about pushing all right, so how can you improve your pooping woes, right? So this is where um, breathing and toileting posture are really gonna make a difference. And if it, there's anything that you get out of this is using something underneath your feet to help um, put those muscles on slack so that um, elimination is really easy. And before we get into like how to coordinate breathing with pelvic floor, I have to kind of teach you a little bit about this guy right here, the diaphragm. This is your breathing muscle. It sits underneath your rib cage. And then you have your liver underneath here and then your stomach and all the abdominal organs and then pelvic floor here. 
These are your pelvic floor muscles, again, acting like a sling. So you can see it's creating like almost a canister or like a balloon. Okay, these are your abdominal muscles in the front, and then this is your spine with all the spinal muscles. So everything is connected, really. When you take a deep breath in, the diaphragm, which is this dome-shaped muscle at rest, when you inhale through the nose or through the mouth, the diaphragm contracts, descending, coming down, stretching, and giving this nice kind of stretch in, uh, into the abdominal um, intestines and the gut. And then it actually, the air flows down through the pelvic floor, and then the pelvic floor muscles also stretch. And that helps to actively lengthen them. So when you're taking that deep inhalation, everything should widen, open, the anus should bulge a little bit, you should feel the urethra open. Things are, this is a good place to be if you want to relax and eliminate, right? When you exhale, the air comes out, everything kind of comes up, pelvic floor muscles come to their normal resting baseline tone, and then diaphragm comes back into its original position. But in order to eliminate and evacuate the bowel, it's really important that we understand how your abdominal muscles can play into it because we've oftentimes been there where we're pushing to try to poop, right? And so it's important that we can use these muscles but in a different way instead of really sucking it in and what I like to call um, this hulking it, instead of hulking it on the toilet seat to try to get that poop out, um, there's easier ways to do it. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, sorry, in a moment. Oh, sorry. So yes, this could be you <laughs> with just a little help from a good old stool. And it doesn't have to be fancy like what I have. You can even use phone books. When I travel, I just turn around the garbage can and put my feet up. It's, you know, just make it real simple and make it real easy. So diaphragmatic breathing, and I'm going to go back to just breathing. So I want everyone to kind of take a deep breath in. Take a deep breath in right now. How would you take a deep breath in? Good. For some of you, I see bellies. For others, I see the chest moving. So if you're finding yourself, you're breathing with the chest, that's more of a chest stress breathing where you're using and pulling everything up and sucking everything up, which means pelvic floor muscles will do the same. Now, in diaphragmatic breathing, when you take, I probably shouldn't stand in front of that, sorry. When you take a deep breath in, the belly should expand. The belly should expand outward, all circular. So you should feel the breath going into your low back, into the lower ribs. So it should be an outward, thinking about it as a canister or a balloon. So the air should fill the lungs into the belly and then down through the pelvic floor, the deep belly breathing, okay? So that's diaphragmatic breathing. And we're going to use that when I demonstrate toileting posture and defecation mechanics. And then this is the toileting posture that I'm going to show you guys. So there's several types of stools that you can use, and I kind of touch bases on it. You can have a stool that's seven to eight inches high, which is, I think, standard for most toilet seats. But if you're one of those that are used to, and I don't, you know, unless you are really good at doing this and comfortable being in this position and have good hip mobility and strength, um, I would advise not to do a bigger one. Because what happens is this is going to be this is great, but it's going to be right in line with the toilet itself. So you're going to be actually hovering over the toilet, over the toilet like that, like as if it was on the ground, but up to you, okay? But you definitely have to have good balance. You have to make sure you have good hip knee flexibility for this one. Um, it's typically common in third, like India and Asia where they're already used to that sort of stuff. But it's good to know that you have this option. Um, this is more for me, <laughs> where Put your feet on the stool, hips are nice and wide. Most people like to sit like this, pants down to here. That really clamps down on the tubes functionally even. So if you just spread the knees really wide, it's gonna help open up that pelvis, okay? You're gonna lean forward, you're gonna put your arms onto your forearms. I don't want you slouching, which is what I tell my patients because they'll usually end up doing this. It's very hard for that belly to move and breathe, okay? It's very difficult. When you take a deep breath in, so I want you to kind of breathe. In this posture, it really straightens out that rectum. We know in that picture that I showed you where it's like the puborectalis wrapping around. Well, this position really helps put everything on slack. And then we're gonna use breathing to help facilitate elimination of the bowel now. So you take a deep belly breath in through the, for, through the belly, taking a deep breath in. 
And then as you breathe out, you gently tighten the ab abdominal muscles, just gently, as if you were just like 10, 15% going to contract them, and then to push. And you should feel the anus bulge and not tighten up. You should not feel your, your butt muscles tense. You shouldn't feel like it should be hard. And this will definitely help make things really, really, really flawless especially if you're, if you're dealing with constipation. It will definitely help. And it will help with digestion, with bloating, because constipation can create bloating. So that's toileting posture, and this is what I teach my patients in the clinic every day, and we practice together. Um, we also use certain techniques like um, biofeedback, where I can put sensors around the pelvic floor muscles, and you can see them on screen. What are they doing? Are they tightening or are they relaxing? Um, so there are many ways that we can kind of challenge this to help retrain the nervous system and retrain the connection to the brain and to these muscles to, to facilitate relaxation and proper um, function. So that's toileting posture. So breathing, gently, gently pushing. And when I, I forgot to mention this, but not to hold your breath while you're pushing. And that goes back to that um, picture with the Hulk. Um, there's no sense in turning green and really just holding your breath and pushing for dear life because, again, those muscles are just going to tighten right back up and inhibit the urge, stop the urge, stop the flow, which will result in incomplete evacuation and poor digestive health in general. So when you're breathing out and you're doing the toileting posture and you're breathing, you definitely, as you're pushing, you want to exhale. You can grunt, you can sing a song, you can cry uncle, I don't care what you do, but just make sure that you try to breathe as you're gently pushing to evacuate the bowel movement, and this will help prevent all the other issues that we kind of touched base upon um, in today's presentation. Yeah, that's a great question. So how the evaluation, so that's going into evaluating, like how do I know what these muscles are doing? I can tell a lot from just observing these muscles. So I, it definitely is an intimate evaluation. It would be, I'm looking at your, your private area here, and I'm just observing. What happens when you cough? Are these muscles contracting? Are they working the way they're supposed to? Okay, great. What happens when you bear down? And then I assess that. I'm like, are you holding your breath? Are you squeezing your, your glutes? Because you can definitely see these muscles move. Again, just like the bicep, it's very minimal, and, it, and you have to have a trained eye, but you can see these muscles move back and forth. When you tighten and lift, you'll see the anus close, the, cl the anus will wink, wink at you, and then everything will pull up. <laughs> Call it the anal wink. It'll wink and it'll lift up. So, that's, that'll give me a clue to what, on the, on the externally, what I can see, and that usually tells me a lot. And then if the patient is comfortable and I teach them about this, and usually they are, and, it's, and it doesn't hurt at all, but I usually go in and try to feel, okay, what are these muscles doing? And then it, that usually does involve a vaginal or a rectal examination of the deeper muscles, because there's a, a lot of layers to them, of what those muscles are actually doing. Because it could be even a, a, um, a spastic muscle that just needs to be stretched and released internally and manually to really help kind of relax the pelvic floor in general, especially if you're suffering from pain, any type of pain, pelvic pain or abdominal pain. These are ones you want to look at. And the, the person themselves, like what sensations are they feeling? Like always discomfort? Um, yeah, well, it, it, are you, do you? Yeah, it should feel it should feel like you didn't have any um, you didn't have to push at all really. If you're relaxing completely, it should really flow out normally. But that depends on the consistency of your stool too. So you typically want snake-like, smooth kind of soft serve ice cream kind of poop. But if you you end up having really hard, lumpy stools, or on the flip side, if you have like diarrhea and very very loose and watery stools, that also is an indication or could be an indication of constipation, because you might be constipated and the only thing that's going through is something that's more watery. And so we, it's, it's kind of like you have to really analyze everything. What's diet, fluid intake, most people aren't drinking enough water, not getting enough of the right type of fiber, um, exercise. So it should not feel difficult to have a bowel movement. And in, in fact, if you are having pain or you find yourself struggling or it's taking you a long time or you're going frequently, like having several bowel movements all in the morning, that could be an indication that you're not completely emptying and we need to kind of does that answer yeah between bowel movements 
No. Why, did, when you said a long time, what were you just referring to? When you just said, like, how long are you on the Yeah, right. How long are you on the long group? Oh, if you're struggling, I would say anything more than like 20 minutes. If you're really, if you're sitting on there and you're struggling and nothing's coming out, I wouldn't sit there for too long either because that means you're, you're really straining and these muscles are really kind of in that lengthened position and it could further dispose you to like, um, you know, tenderness and pain and hemorrhoids and fissures and stuff like that. So, um, you know, that's why I kind of caution bringing stuff in there because we can get really distracted and just, we're done with our pooping, but we're still sitting on the toilet for like 30, 45 minutes. That's probably a, you know, a no-no because that could really create, that's a lot of pressure in that area for that length of time in that position. And that could predispose you to hemorrhoids as well. Just like yeah. sitting for too long. Yeah. Yeah, because it's open. There's no support on the bottom. So everything is coming down and lengthening, which it should because it serves its function, but um, after that you want to just get up and go. <laughs> can, can you send me a, that photo? Oh, which one? This one? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I always say, like, don't hulk it. <laughs> so, any, any other questions? Those are really good. Those are really good. And I know this is sometimes a shy topic, so. Is there any chance of any Um, to my knowledge, there is no literature out there that significantly says that constipation is hereditary unless there are other comorbidities such as Crohn's or IBS or a neurological dysfunction. Um, but I do hear that quite often, like, oh, my mom had it. But again, she may have just had a simple issue of, like, just unable to relax or you know maybe she had a, a prolapse that no one even knew about um, you know so there might have been other things that are, are contributing to why one gets a constipation and it is multifactorial but I do believe that l lifestyle changes diet water exercise and then a little bit of hands-on work and just knowledge about this part can help tremendously it may or may not fix it all but it will help tremendously yeah any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, the scar tissue thing, what yeah. do you, if, if, some, if you have scar tissue from a long time ago, are there exercises? Or uh, so I do, I specialize in visceral therapy, and what visceral therapy is, it just means organ therapy. And they're precisely, so I would work the organ, and I would actually mobilize the scar tissue around the organ. Um, and then I would do other organs in the area. So it's very gentle, but it's precise, and it really follows the tensions of your body. Um, it's almost like an art form, really, when I do that assessment, because there could be several lines of tension that are contributing to this one big one, and we have to release that and then work on the, on the main one as well. So yeah, they're, they're, it's a manual therapy, kind of like a abdominal massage, but working specifically on the organ systems themselves. And then I do neural work, which will connect the nervous system, some cranial work to the gut to help improve peristalsis as well. And it's, I, it's very beneficial for someone that has IBS, Crohn's, because really it just creates that parasympathetic rest and digest nervous system to allow an appropriate he, uh, environment for healing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, because you're not, because constipation really is stopping that peristalsis and it can create adhesions inside the colon itself if things are not moving well. Because things are meant to move and slosh and glide inside the, the digestive system. And if things are pretty stagnant, you're really not getting a lot of that venolymphatic, that vascular flow in and out. And then that constipation can create inflammation within the colon itself. So, yeah. That's a great question. Yep. Any other questions? Over yeah. several years, I've tried to use magnesium to regulate. Um, but it's like I become dependent upon it. Mm. Meg is right, because it's a stimulant. It's a stimulant. And although not habit, I mean, I haven't read anything that it's habit forming per se, but it will make your stools very loose. 
if, especially if it's magnesium citrate, because there's different forms of magnesium. Yeah, citrate is the one that's going to really, you know, make your stools really loose. If you're getting really, really loose bowel movements, you should really have them formed and snake-like. You might be taking too much. That could be an indicator of being too much, yeah, but... So if you're still constipated, yeah, and, that, and this is where, you know, I would come into play and say, okay, what, what's going on with the organ systems themselves? What's restricted? What your pelvic floor muscles are doing? And then, I mean, you can even try doing a step stool and just breathing and how much that can even help kind of with that, with that constipation. A, I had a gastrointestinal bug about three months. <coughs> I don't know, Super Bowl Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, I vomited so much I had to go to the emergency and they gave me the fluids and stuff and nausea and the next day. But honestly, it hasn't been nice. Mm -hmm. I'm taking some probiotics now, trying to get the yeah. bacteria back in. Uh, it's, it's definitely irritable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and like I said, the in infection and being sick, that pretty, sounds pretty traumatic what your body went through and you're still healing your gut, which would be the visceral work that would actually probably benefit you quite a bit because we're really working the organ systems because that creates some adhesions internally from inflammation. It sounds like it was kind of violent for you. Yeah, yeah, no fun. Yeah, well, just restoring the connection, waking things up a little bit. Yeah. Um, the sneezing. Yeah. You know, Like what happens with your pelvic floor muscles when you sneeze? Yeah. Yeah, so when you sneeze, a lot of pressure, or you, when you cough, a lot of pressure goes down through the pelvic, through your abdomen and through the pelvic floor. These muscles reflexively clamp down on the tubes that empty your, your, your bladder and your, your bowel. So they kind of tighten, like they contract like your bicep. That's what they're supposed to do. And then when you're done, they relax. But if you have like COPD or asthma, that can also predispose someone to like a prolapse where these, these muscles get really fatigued, it gets weak, you're coughing, it's just too much repetitive stress and strain through this system in your body and they just, they poop out. They just, they just, they can't compensate anymore or they're overly, they're overly tightened. Like if I walked around with my bicep all day like that and I did that for several years, I, it wouldn't be easy to stretch it. It's the same thing here. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Lot, lots of pressure. Yeah. If you're dealing with lots of pressure in through the rib cage, you know, and I always look at, you have to look at the whole body and not just here because what happens on top also affects what's happening below. And so if somebody's not breathing well or their rib cage is really restricted, we have to kind of clear that so that they are able to breathe and that movement and fluidity can happen instead of having so, such a, like a tourniquet on top and then all this pressure on below, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so if you're, if this goes back to the rectus meal. Mm -hmm. if, if you're having that bulging, can that be repaired or is that like a permanent condition? Can that be repaired? It depends on how, because you have different degrees or varying degrees of mm -hmm. prolapse. The mild to moderate ones are, they, literature has shown a great improvement with pelvic floor physical therapy because of the fact that we balance out that area and then we teach you techniques that help save or preserve, like let's say you're lifting, you're bending, what activities are you doing, extra certain exercises to either strengthen. Sometimes we have to lengthen before we strengthen. It's not just about doing kegels, and that's like my mini disclaimer. Um, I, I hear this all the time where doctors will say, well, just do a couple kegels. Well, if those muscles are really tight and you try to tighten them even more, I can't tighten anymore. And so they're efficiently working. And so you have to, we ha that's where I come in to really analyze what's really going on, what do you need as an individual so that we can kind of help repair and restore. But no, and, and posture has a lot to do with uh, how the organs are sitting in your pelvis as well. You know, if you're, if you're kind of this way, it's creating a lot of pressure and compression. Yeah, so that, yeah, that's a great question, but it's, it's definitely, um, pelvic floor therapy can help. I can't always guarantee that it will fix it, but I've seen some really awesome results with it, not only with myself, but other colleagues in, in this realm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great questions, guys. Does anyone want to practice? <laughs> Hands on, free, you know, come on. <laughs> Nobody wants to practice? <laughs> Try out some of the stools. 
this one other question. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. How did you like to go into this? I love that question. The million dollar question. Woo! Where's the prize? Okay. That was the secret one. No, I'm kidding. Um, so I, believe it or not, so I'm, th I'm 32. I'm going to age myself. I'm 32. I was 24 years old. I was jumping on a trampoline with my godson. And I thought I was really sweating a lot down there. I thought it was sweat. And then I freaked out because I'm like, wait, this is not just sweat. And I ran to the bathroom and it was urine. And I ended up peeing all over myself. And then I was like, hmm, this is a problem. I have not had any kids. Like, what's going on? Is this a problem? Like, and um, I started to do some research. And I had my friend, honest to God, I'm not kidding. She sent me a link to shadow a pelvic floor physical therapist. This is like all in the interim of two days, I think to shadow a pelvic floor physical therapist because she thought I would be interested, and here I am. And I shadowed her, I did an internship, I went through more schooling and education and training, and I helped myself, and, amongst other things, because um, pelvic floor dysfunction can lead to not only the incontinence issue, but um, painful intercourse, which it should never be painful. And um, so yeah, that's where I'm at. That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful! Picture frames. Yeah, there you go. Picture frame, squatty potty. Picture frame, squatty potty. How do you want to decorate your house? Squatty potty. Right, right, exactly, exactly. And they slide, they slide nicely underneath the toilet seat. Yeah, these are fancy. It's some, I, they were donated to me, which I'm very thankful for. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and like I said, any old, any old step stool will do as long as it's wide enough and old phone books or books that you just have lying around or magazines, prop them up. Doesn't have to be fancy. Doesn't, health, the health doesn't have to be fancy. <laughs> yeah, those are great questions. So, yeah, feel free. I mean, you guys can experiment. <laughs> so... They actually have overactive pelvic floor muscles, and 40% of athletes have incontinence. Gymnasts, trampolinists, <coughs> crossfitters. That's because they're, over, they're really straining, they're overactive, and they're tight, and they're not relaxing them, and then they have incontinence because the muscle is not working. It's just doing this. Yeah, 40% of athletes have incontinence. And they just don't talk about it. They just don't. They just don't. They're under a lot of pressure, too. But... Any other questions? Speak now, speak now. I'm kidding. You can always email me too. I know how um, nerve wracking it can be with many people in the room. So you, I am, I'm an open book, open communication. My website is, and my email is on my card. Feel free to email me with any personal questions or talk to me after class. Can you speak to yoga's impact on the Yes, yoga is actually really fantastic. It just depends on the type of yoga you like to do. And, but the breathing that's involved with the yoga, not only for the benefits of the nervous system and relaxing you and kind of grounding you, but it also is a great with hip opening, stretching, um, the diaphragmatic breathing that you do. And the more that you're in tune with how these muscles should feel when you take a deep breath in, it'll be a game changer for you. Because when you're in a pelvic, like in a pose, you can choose to contract them or you can choose to relax them. You, you can engage them in any way that you want. So it's really, it's really cool. Yeah, yoga, I think, is is such a safe um, exercise and really beneficial in many ways. My wife is going to be so happy when I tell her that she said to breathe because yeah. her advice is always to our girls to make, just breathe. <laughs> that's awesome. That's great. Kudos. That's awesome. Yeah, just breathe. Yeah, and don't and don't read any crazy Facebook posts. <laughs> videos and yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Make it a relaxing spa, uh, uh, spa uh, experience every time. <laughs>
What else is really... Oh, peppermint oil, too. Sorry, I'm going to mention this, but if you put a little, uh, like, two, three drops in the toilet bowl before you, like, sit down, peppermint oil will help increase blood flow to the area and help relax it, especially if you're dealing with, like, trouble or, like, pain or painful bowel movements. It's like a vape... It's like an essential oil for your pelvis. You just put it in the toilet bowl, you sit over it, and it really helps to kind of open up that area, blood flow-wise. Yeah, peppermint oil. It's great. So... Yeah. Peppermint oil. It's good for everything, right? So, cool. Yeah, no, please, you have, you're doing great. Okay. If one person did have cancer in their colon already and mm -hmm. then decided to explore this avenue, um, depending, of course, on the stage, I'm sure there's so many variables that could go right. with each individual, but um, would it be, would it, to what degree could that be beneficial? It just, that's a great question. It depends on how their bowel health or the, the health of this area is impacting them. So they might have the cancer, but how is it impacting their function in terms of having a bowel movement? Um, do they have radiation or not? It, it depends on their stage and what they're going through. Um, you don't want to, I mean, if it's active, um, I kind of just try to work around, not directly. Um, but it, it really depends on their goals and what they want to get out of the session in therapy, like if it's more for relaxing that area, because obviously that area is being a little bit, I would say, traumatized, um, you know, we can incorporate more of the breath work and relaxation just to kind of help with peristalsis naturally. Um, yeah, but it, it, it depends on what their goals are. Yeah, it's hard to say, but good question. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Any more questions, concerns, comments? Again, feel free to email me with any personal questions. I'll you know I'll do my best to answer them, and uh, if I can help in any way, I'm here to serve you guys. So thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.